Good day, everybody, and welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia. I'm proud to welcome you to this edition of our 2021-2022 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. The lecture series is supported by UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA Brain Institute, the, U the UVA College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Data Science, and through a grant from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. This year's theme is the ethical challenges of artificial intelligence in biomedicine, where we will enjoy presentations on Fridays from leading thinkers about the promise opportunities and hurdles associated with AI applications in the biomedical sciences. Selected participants in our Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab program will leverage these presentations as vital material for our culminating in-person grant development workshop that's to be held here in beautiful Charlottesville, Virginia next June. Applications for the Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab are still being accepted until January 31st, 2022. That is on Monday, end of day on Monday. So if you are interested or you have junior faculty colleagues who are interested, please encourage them to submit their materials um, and you can do so at the link provided on the screen. Today, I am absolutely delighted to welcome our speaker, um, Dr. Lana Garmeyer from the University of Michigan. Uh, Lana is an associate professor in the Department of Computational Medicine and Bioinformatics at the University of Michigan. Her translational bioinformatics research areas include single cell bioinformatics, multimodal data integration of complex diseases using genomics, imaging and EMR data, and drug uh, reposition. She has published over 80 papers in leading journals, including Cell as well as Nature, and she's delivered over 70 invited talks to institutes, including the National Library of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences. She served on various NIH study sections and currently is a standing member of the BDMA study section. She's on the editorial advisory board for Genome Biology and the Journal of Proteome Research, and she was an awardee of the U.S. Presidential Early Career Scientists and Engineers uh, award in 2019. Uh, the research that her group um, uh, pursues has been funded by the NIH for over the last past 10 years. In continuing uh, with our theme of biomedical data science um, in um, ethical challenges in artificial intelligence biomedicine, Lana's lecture today is entitled Current Practice Challenges and Perspectives on Single Cell Data Science. Single cell sequencing is now has now enabled the study of many complex biological systems at an unprecedented level of resolution. In her talk today, Lana will be first overviewing the working principle of single cell RNA-seq, the most dominant form of single cell data. She will also show the steps of a typical single cell RNA-seq analysis, including pre-processing and downstream function analysis, She'll demonstrate how the next generation single cell RNA-seq meta-analytic meta tools engage both bioinformaticians and bench scientists. And she'll conclude um, by noting ongoing challenges and the very technological perspectives which in, uh, are present in the field. As always, we are streaming this lecture live and for recording via YouTube. If you are watching on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. Also, our specially selected 2021-2022 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants strongly encouraged to submit their questions for Lana via the chat feature in their Zoom sessions. I'll synthesize these questions and ask the, um, those questions on your behalf uh, during the last 10 minutes or so of the lecture. And without further ado, Dr. Garmeyer, thank you so much. We are very much looking forward to your lecture. First, I was just, just going to um, outline the presentation today. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction and the background of the uh, single cell uh, biomedical field. And then, you know, we always, as data scientists, uh, we are ne necessary to understand where those data are generated from, uh, how are they generated from. And then I will spend the most majority of the time to talk about uh, some typical single cell RNA-seq analysis workflows. As you may know that a single cell RNA-seq is one of the most dominant form of the uh, single cell uh, genomic data types. And uh, near the end, I will briefly mention about some other single cell research areas and the current ongoing challenges and the perspectives for the field to move forward. So I'd like to think that uh, you have some uh, very basic uh, biology or genomics background. If you don't, for some reason, please be, uh, DM me or email me. Um, I also assume that you're very interested in this field 
and perhaps you're even starting to do single cell bioinformatics research. So this is a slide that I really uh, often I use to introduce about this topic. Why do we need to do single cell? Uh, here, this is a picture I got from Twitter. I'm pretty active on Twitter's community. As you can see, you know, here on the top is an image of a dinosaur. It has certain features, mean and standard deviation and correlation among different data points. On the bottom, there are 12 images. They have exactly the same features as the dinosaur. However, they're by no means dinosaurs. So this is the dilemma that we used to face when we did bulk sequencing technology, where you ground everything up and take the average, but you don't know the detail. And as we know now, that the devils are really in the detail. In fact, single cell RNA seq has been so important that it was being named the breakthrough technology of year 2018 by science. More recently, the spatial transdomics, another new technology, has been named the breakthrough of the year 2020. And here I'm showing you a very beautiful picture from uh, uh, Dr. John Wei Wei's group, where they developed the a new methodology called a MRFISH that allows researchers to zoom into individual cells to have very, very finite single cell resolution and look at all uh, over 10,000 genes expression simultaneously among various cells. Uh, and at the same time, you will have this spatial resolution, which is really, really wonderful. In fact, this technology is not success overnight. It has a history at least 10 years. Here is a paper that was published almost 10 years ago. And the author had a very bold title, Single Cell Sequencing Based Technologies Will Revolutionize the Whole Organism Science. And now, in retrospect, that statement is really true. And the authors predicted several domains of, of discoveries that can be widely dis, uh, used or, or, or found by single cell technologies. For example, you can reveal genomic variations among individual cells, and you could reconstruct the cellular ancestries in the form of a lineage tree. And you could also study the functional states of individual cells. You can discover new cell types using single cell technology. Also, the authors rightfully predicted that you can now simultaneously analyze genomics, transcriptomics, and epigenomic states of the cells, so to speak, multi-omics in single cell. And finally, they stated that this, this new technologies will shed light on fundamental questions of biology and medicine, which is really very much the, the core of the technology's applications. So here is the landscape of the single cell research, which is becoming more and more complex every single day. So here I'm showing you a hierarchical tree, you know, starting with this domain, so-called single cell research, depending on the data that you generate that have spatial resolution or non-spatial resolution, it can, divide, can be divided into non-spatial omics and spatial omics. And on the non-spatial omics, depending on how many types of omics data are generated, it can be subdivided into single omics or multi-omics. And under the single omics, depending on the types of data, it can be, either single cell RNA-seq or single cell exome seq or single cell uh, deamethylation. And on the other hand, on the spatial omics platform, now most, dominantly form, mo most dominant form is single omics, but also most recently last year, there's a new platform that allows one to do multi-omics at the same time under the spatial contact. So as you can see that the, the, the landscape is getting very, very complex. And for the purpose of today's presentation, I'm just gonna focus on single cell RNA-seq. So this is a brief overview of the history of single cell RNA-seq technology. It came a long way, starting sometime around 2009. And it went over time, the, the number of the cells that can be studied has increased in a long linear fashion. And some of the key points I like to you know, point out is uh, why is a smart seq technology, which was used later in fluidum. Fluidum is a technology that was very 
a prominent and has a full length uh, sequencing capacity. Uh, it was very, very popular in 2014. And then later on, other uh, labs uh, started to develop other uh, technologies, for example, DropSeq. Some of you would have, must have heard. And most importantly, 10X Genomics is a commercial company that made the single cell technology as a, a lab use in a, a ordinary daily base. So this is currently the most dominant uh, platform, if not the most dominant platform. So of course, because those technologies have different uh, 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 protocols to begin with, they have different features, right? Uh, some of them can measure the full body of MRA. Some of them have strand specificity. Some of them have bias towards the three prime, uh, three prime end of the MRA transcript. Some of them are, you know, at the resolution of a UMI labeled a resolution, very specific. Here, I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of the single cell RNA seq data generated by 10x genomics. So this is a workflow from getting the sample to getting the uh, data matrix of single cell experiment. I can um, divide it roughly into two parts, experimental part and computational part. Um, for data scientists, what we care most is computational part. But also, I think it's necessary to introduce the experimental part very briefly so that you know what kind of you know, features the data have and why it's challenging, and then also at the same time interesting to analyze single cell data. So here's the workflow of the experimental part. So 10X use a, a, it's a microfluid device, basically. What it does is to have this kind of gel-based uh, gel beads. Each of the beads look, uh, is shown here. It has a so-called barcode on UMI that can be tagged on uh, a specific MRI transcript. So when, when you do the experiment, tanks experiment, what happens is that those gel beads will go through one channel and then the cells will be fed into this perpendicular channel and fuse with those gel beads. And also next, they will go to an oil phase where the gel beads and the cell, individual single cells will be encapsulated into oil bubble. And so this kind of encapsulation allows uh, biochemical enzyme reaction happen. And then here is the next step. Uh, <clears throat> you collect those, those gel beads individually into oil, oil bubble and you do reverse transcription. And what happens is that those individual cells now are lysed and then the MRAs are being, uh, being amplified, the signals will come out. And so after that, you get those, you get those oil bubbles to be uh, popped up and then becomes a, a solution. And then through the whole thing into a sequencing machine. So at the end, what we get out of the sequencing machine is uh, for X number of cells, you have Y number of genes being expressed. So here is a graphic example to show, you know, uh, the kind of things that come out that you have each gene will have a certain number of reads. And we use that read number to help us to uh, form this data matrix, raw data matrix. So 10X has its own uh, platform to do the uh, upstream data pro processing using Cell Ranger. So what it happened briefly in Cell Ranger is that you know, FASTQ reads data coming from sequencing machine will be aligned by this, pro, uh, this uh, uh, aligner called a star. Of course, you know, our field has uh, um, many other alignment tools, but it's not a, uh, today's topic. Um, TX use star for the alignment. After that, you will uh, count the transcripts and then form this kind of gene cell matrix. And here is a dummy example of the gene cell matrix. As you can see, you know, some of the cells have zero expression of certain gene, but non-zero expression of some other genes. So this kind of zero can be truth and can be artifact. And when this artifact, we call it a dropout event. So briefly, the characteristics of single-cell data are the following. 
the data metrics are sparse. There are a lot of zeros. They're very noisy because of the technology limitation. They have very high dropout rates, up to 50 to 70%. And they're also affected by very significant batch effects. Some of the batch effects are known, some are very difficult to control experimentally and needs to be adjusted computationally. And also those data metrics, they can come from different methodologies besides 10X platform. And as we already know, this field has been exploding. Uh, the data size that are generated from single cell studies are really growing rapidly and so on and so forth. So here's a picture to show you, you know, some of the characteristic of the single cell data. So here's a scatter plot of two cells that come from the same tissue type. The scatter plot, as you can see, you know, this kind of event here, where some genes are showing up in one cell, but not in other cell, these are called dropout events. And also another very unique phenomenon is over dispersion in single cell data. Currently, there have been some pretty mature single cell RNA-seq analysis software kits. The most well-known one is called Surat. And then also there's Monocle and the Scampi. Surat is developed by New York Genome Center PI Satija. And it is our package. It has a very comprehensive functions going from QC to analysis, exploration of the single cell RNA data, and nowadays even integration with spatial omics data. So it has very well documented, it's very well documented, very well maintained. They also have workshop for uh, the users to get started. It has built-in functions to read the 10x genomics data. It also, also implemented most of the steps needed in the common analysis. So it's very comprehensive toolkit. So here is an example of some of the uh, single cell RNA-seq analysis pipeline. Here I'm showing you one example. Those pipelines, depending on the user's need, vary here and there, but there are certain themes and features, modules that are in common. For this particular pipeline, you start uploading the uh, single cell data and you go through steps of including imputation, normalization, filtering the genes, and filtering the cells and log transformation. Some of the packages require log transformation. So this part is the pre-processing and downstream would be, you know, more like a functional analysis related to biology. So what usually happens is, you know, users will do dimension reduction and then after dimension reduction, they would use tools to visualize the uh, subpopulations in single cell data. And the different subpopulations can then undergo differential expression analysis and also marker gene identification. And also at the same time, you know, for those different subpopulations, they're done by using different clustering approach. For different clusters, you may want to find out what exactly the cell type they are. So there's the next step that's optional. It's called annotation. Also, some of the traditionally bulk level analysis tools or methods can also be adapted here in single cell analysis. For example, gene study enrichment analysis. For example, protein-protein network analysis. And another thing that is very, very unique about single cell analysis is allows us, it allows us to do pseudo-time reconstruction as well. So here's the second example of single cell RNA-seq analysis pipeline. Here, the authors divided them into three different uh, uh, functional uh, groups, pre-processing, semi-learning, you do quantity control, cell and gene filtering, normalization, and then you do clustering, identify variable genes, dimension reduction, identify marker genes and clustering. And then downstream, interpret the biology to get a differentially expressed genes, assign different cell type, and then other functional annotations, for example, so the time reconstruction. So here's the third way. Without going into the detail, I'm just gonna bypass this because it, it really uh, is very similar for the majority part of the analysis modules. So this is the first step for quality control and filtering. So quality control, 
why why do we do quality control? As we know that a single cell data, they are they are uh, poor quality. Uh, they have a lot of noises, so you need to filter out the cells or the genes that are of poor quality first. And also, in the uh, preparation of those samples, sometimes the cells undergo a lot of stress. And so by looking at the mitochondrial gene reads, it's a good way to filter out the cells that have gone, gone through a lot of stress and you can eliminate them. And also another reason is to remove the cells with poor quality, like, like I just mentioned. So to do that, you can use the filtering approach. Uh, you can filter the cells with certain per percentage of a mitochondrial reads higher than a cutoff. And here down here is an example. So here is a plot that shows you the intensity shows you the, the mitochondria counts. You know, the higher the value is in those different data points, each of the data point is a cell. So the higher the color is, the more stressed out the cell is. So you can utilize certain threshold to remove those cells that are uh, have a lot of stress. Uh, also, uh, Users often use different filtering approach to filter the cells with less and lower threshold on the number of the genes or number of the cells, as you can see here. So you have two threshold on two dimensions based on number of gene, based on the number of genes and based on the number of cell counts. Uh, another type of uh, quality control um, is called a doublet removal. Why do we need to remove doublet and how do they even come out? Sometimes, when we prepare this kind of a single cell droplets, occasionally two cells or even more than two cells can accidentally go into one droplet. And so those cells, those results, are obviously they're not a single cell resolution, they are multiple cell resolution, so they need to be removed. And most recently, there has been a very serious benchmark study that evaluated eight different dropout uh, detection methods and the author claimed that a doublet finder uh, using a comprehensive set of metrics here, they claimed that the doublet finder is the best method. So this field of doublet removal is getting more and more mature, which is a good thing. Next, I'm gonna briefly talk about a normalization. Why do we even want to do normalization? Normalization is to correct for the second step variations from different single cells. If we do not correct the sex and depth bias, then they're like oranges and apples. You cannot compare them across the board. So the most simple way to do normalization as coded in SORAT is to normalize gene expression for each of the cell by total number of reads. And then you multiply by some scaling factor, for example, 10,000 reads. And then you can do log two transformation on the scale that uh, counts. So that's the most simple way of normalization. After you do the fil filtering or normalization of those reads, then we can do you know, more interesting data analysis. One of the first steps of, of the data analysis is to reduce the dimension. Um, for folks who study genomics, we know very well that uh, you know, uh, genomics data have this uh, curse of a high dimensionality. It has a lot, a lot of features to begin with. So it's necessary to reduce the features to the ones that are really embedding biological information. So here are two examples of the commonly used dimension reduction method. The one on the left is called PCA. We all know that a PCA is to transform the features into linear orthogonal space, principal components. And on the right hand is called UMAP, Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection. So UMAP and sometimes the TSNI are used to help the uh, authors to present their data down to two dimensional space, as you can see here. But the advantage of UMAP over TSNI is that it preserves the local structure and also global structure better. But bear in mind, both those types of dimension reduction methods, they're nonlinear. So you cannot really directly understand the distance meaning on the two dimension, the distance, for example, between the blue versus the, the orange, the blue versus the red, what it exactly mean? It's not a linear term, but it's a good way to have a visualization. So recently there has been a very uh, 
comprehensive benchmark study to look at the many different dimension reduction methods. From my colleague, Dr. Zhou Xiang's group in University of Michigan Biostar Department. And here, as the heat map shows, you know, there are good, met, uh, good methods, intermediate behavior methods and poor methods. As you can see here, PCA and UMAP, as I demonstrated to you earlier, they're actually among the very top or very distant methods for dimension reduction. So after dimension reduction, what happened next is clustering. There are also many, 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 many clustering methods. We're not lacking clustering methods in the single cell data science field. But in this benchmark study, what it shows in common is that SURAT and SC3, the clustering methods that embedded in, uh, encoded in SURAT and SC3 are among the top performing methods. So SURAT's clustering method, it's uh, using the graph-based approach. And SC3, I'm showing you the citation here, it is a consensus clustering approach. After clustering, you visualize your data this way, and then, you know, SURAT or uh, other program can give you different uh, clusters. And then what happened next, which is very interesting to biologists, is to identify what those cell types are for each of the clusters. Or sometimes, you know, one cell type can actually have several different clusters called subpopulations. So this process is called a cell type annotation. As you can see here, one example, you go from unannotated clustering to annotated cell types. There have been many different cell type annotation methods, automatic, uh, automatic cell type annotation methods already. Also, bear in mind, at the same time, you know, the end users, they like to have their own biomarkers and then do a manual uh, cell type annotation as well. But that really doesn't scale up and it doesn't really help to identify new, uh, new cell types or rare cell types, new rare cell types. So one of the example is a single R. Single R method, it has these three different steps. So what it has is to use the unannotated single cell RNA data and borrow the strings coming from the reference transcriptomics that has identified a pure cell type information. Use that as a reference to help annotate the single cell RNA data. At the end, you're gonna get annotated cell, uh, single cell, uh, cell types. So it has these three steps, step number one, identify the variable genes among cell types in the reference data set. So you need to identify the most different, differentially expressed genes, variable genes that are cell type specific in the reference data set. And then correlate those reference, uh, uh, reference data set with each of the single cell data. And also the authors wanted to improve the, the uh, accuracy to identify the cell types that are highly identical to each other. So they have iterative uh, refinement approach, which is really nice. So different methods have recently been benchmarked. Uh, this is one um, benchmark study from our group where we evaluated over 10 different methods to do automatic uh, cell type annotation. And we, what, what we found is that a single R and a threat are the top two best methods Cross the board using different metrics. However, one minor uh, downside of SRAT is that uh, it is not very good at identifying rare cell types automatically. So there's also another very, very important type of analysis module in single cell analysis called pseudo time trajectory analysis. And here I'm showing you an example of method called a slingshot. It is a, it is a very uh, well-cited method. So um, here's a graph to demonstrate how the uh, snapshot works. It has, again, three steps. First, 
it derives a minimum spanning tree going through different data points. Okay, and then next, it use it, it derives the simultaneous principal curves to smooth through this different uh, different path. At the end, it projects the single cell data to this principal curve and identifies the distance between them. So the projected distance then is called the pseudo time. Pseudo time trajectory uh, research also has been you know, pretty uh, mature. There are many, many, many methods out there. Uh, as you can see, single cell data science is very prosperous. <laughs> um, recently, there's a benchmark method that evaluates uh, over 45 different types of trajectory uh, analysis method. And what they found is consensus wise, the two methods, slingshot and the PHA, they behave the best, especially when they uh, look at the linear development and also bifurcation development case. However, currently, you know, most of the methods don't do so well when the pseudo time trajectory have a circular, circular kind of structure. It's very difficult for those algorithms to pick up the true signal. So now I just wanted to recap of what we went through briefly on some of the specific modules or functions of single cell RSC data analysis. We talked about the normalization, we talked about the gene and the cell filtering, we talked about the dimension reduction, we talked about the visualization, clustering, and the cell type annotation and through the time reconstruction. So those are programmable tools, but what about the data portals? Data portals are aimed to uh, take away the burdens of users so that they can check the results quickly. And a lot of times for the end users who don't know how to program, it becomes the only way for them to do it themselves. One of the big problem of current data portals are mostly closed platform, meaning that the users cannot really customize their own pipelines. And even if the users can customize their own pipelines, the developers cannot contribute their methods to these data portals. And also the different functionality tools, they're coded in different languages. It's very difficult to get them to be assembled into some you know, uniform um, platform. So our solution to this outstanding issue is to develop this, uh, this uh, inclusive tool called Granatom X. So we have a unified internal data structure to allow the sharing of different, different information between packages. Here we call the packages, specific packages that perform certain functions as Gbox. It's wrapped Gbox. And also Granatom X has a central repository for well-defined packages regardless of how or what program languages those packages come from. The users can customize their own pipelines. And on the other hand, very importantly, the developers can deposit their own methods into this meta-analysis tool. So it's very inclusive. It's open to the users. It's open to the developers. And lastly, we, we care about the efficiency. We care about the scaling up. So this tool can handle large data sets especially when it takes up a lot of, um, a, a lot of single cell size upfront as input data. Here is the you know, graph presentation of the design idea behind the Granite Max. So it really tried to bridge the two communities, biologists and bioinformaticians. On the front end, the biologists can put in the information of their single cell data and the metadata for their samples. And then you can just run through, you know, pipelines that you would like to build yourself. And then you can get a reproducible results and you can share results with your collaborators. And you can also, you know, copy paste the results to put it in, into publications. On the back end, we wrap up different functionalities into this very essential 
thing called Gbox. Gbox, it has this kind of container based, based approach. Uh, and as a result, you know, the original module can be written in different languages. And so we provide the Gbox as a repository, like App Store, for the users to pick and choose which ones they wanted to assemble together in their own pipeline. So it really provides a lot of flexibility for the end users. And more, more also, we also aim to make the Grantum X very, uh, very applicable to various types of computational reads. For example, you can, you can download it, deploy it into your personal computer. You can use it on the server system. And you can also do the analysis live on, on the cloud. This is the interface of Grantum X. So when you when you start with that URL, and uh, this is what you see. So you give you an introduction of what a Grantum X is capable of doing, certain modules. And you can either choose to use a recommended recipe, meaning pipeline, or you start building your own pipeline. Either way is fine. And here is a, a snapshot of a user uh, customized analysis at the very end, the last step to do pseudo time reconstruction. As you can see, you know, here is the recipe that the users assembled themselves. And here is in the um, blow up of, you know, what kind of modules are going there. For example, you have UMAP, you have Scampi based clustering. You can color the different samples and you can identify the markers, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very comprehensive. You can add it, you can add modules, you can drop modules anytime you want. You can go back and forth, you can re restart the analysis anytime you like. So here's the information of the links for Grantum X. If you want to use the online web tool, this is a link. And if you want to download the source code, you can do that. And also we encourage the developers to write their own GBugs in order to advertise their own packages. So now let me move on to open challenges and perspectives. What I just told you is still just the tip of the iceberg. Single cell data science is a very vast and uh, you know, ever-changing field with increasing complexity every single day. One of the big challenges is to scale up from the single cell resolution to the population resolution. And this idea has been already laid out in this uh, uh, opinion paper. 11 grand challenges in single cell data science, which I really recommend folks to check it out. You know, you have single cell experiments, you can have this beautiful, you know, trajectory uh, <clears throat> at a single cell resolution, and then you have the cell types, specific cell type sub, sub, sub clusters, and then you're working on top at the tissue level, and then you emerge to the organs and then populations. So how can we transverse from very low resolution to the very high resolution. Specifically, this is very important for precision health and pre precision medicine. So those are wild open questions for the field. Also, at the technical level, some other challenges remain. For example, how do you do multi-omics data integration and alignment in single cells? So I like to draw the difference between multi-omic integration versus a multi-omic alignment. What is multi-omic integration? Integration means that you have the technology to be able to assay different omics from the same cells, okay? On the other hand, alignment, meaning that you, you don't get, you do get multiple types of omics, but you don't get them from the exactly the same cells. Rather, you get them from different groups of cells that are highly similar to each other. So those present different challenges. And we just put out a, a review paper to go over all of the current uh, multi-omics data integration and alignment methods in single cells. As you can see here, you know, it has a variety of methods. Some of them are um, matrix factorization based, some of them are neural network based, some of them use network uh, uh, graph theory, et cetera. But what is lacking right now is that there hasn't been systematic benchmarking in evaluating the, all these different methods, specifically for the multi-omic integration. 
there have been some alignment to benchmark effort going on already. So because alignment, you know, this kind of technology came out earlier. So what's what's what I expect next is to uh, somebody will do a systematic comparison of the different model mix data integration methods. Another new frontier is spatial omics. So which is also, you know, very challenging area to work on. Here is a slide to tell you the kind of variety already existing in the spatial omics uh, technology. Depending on the way the technology works, some of them are next generation sequence based, some of them are imaging based. Within imaging based methods, some of them are using sequencing approach, some of them are using in situ hybridization approach. So you end up with very different types of uh, different, 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 different characteristics of the spatial omics data. Some of them are targeted, having fewer uh, genes. Some of them have a lot of genes. And some of them have a higher resolution at a single cell level, but some of them don't. They're in a group of cells. For example, 10X Vizium uh, platform, it's not a single cell resolution, but it has spatial resolution. So there's a lot of complexity and heterogeneity, even in terms of the types of platforms and the type of data that are generated in the spatial omics field. And as you see here, from one of the review papers, most recently came out. Um, there has a, been a lot of different types of analysis you can do as well for the spatial omic data. Just for spatial omic data alone, you will need to do clustering. After you do the cluster, you need to you know capture which 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 clusters belong to what types of cells, and then you need to select the features that are representative of certain types of cells. And you need to go back to the spatial contact to see how those different functions are related in the space. And at the end, you know, some sort of scoring way to relate back to the to the to the end users, uh, where is the hot spot, so to speak. So this is just spatial omics alone. And not to say nowadays studies have start, uh, started to do spatial omics and also other omics together. So the integration is very, very challenging. Another open challenge I think is really worth visiting is benchmarking. Benchmarking, we need to know what types of data sets to use, how many data sets are enough, you know, what are the you know, unbiased reference data sets to use. And for simulation data, are we there yet? How well the simulation data can mimic the reality? And for the metrics, what kind of metrics do you use? Different benchmark studies use different metrics. And some of the metrics may have some sort of bias, one way or another. There hasn't been a very a good agreement across the community, and that needs to be established. And also, you know, what sorts of methods that you will want to evaluate? You know, some of them are not even open source code or commercial platforms. Can you compile around them? The different methods, they may have very different pre-processing steps, and that cumulates with the performance output. So it's very complex. And more, moreover, on top of this, you currently most of the benchmark studies, they themselves, they're ad hoc, they're not evolvable. The truth is that researchers are gonna develop a new and a new, new and more and more new methods. And the benchmark studies for the older methods are gonna be obsolete very quickly. So the benchmark method, benchmark studies themselves need to evolvable so that the new, when the new methods come out, they can just you know, easily compare with what's been done to speed up the research and the innovation. And so you know, here is one of the few examples of so-called cell bench which is the R package that allows some sort of reg regularization to do the benchmark study. And you can you know, use this package for, you, for future uh, use as well. So I think an effort like this is really good to allow the reuse, reusability of the, of the code and making sure that the benchmark studies are gonna be evolvable. So here's a summary of my presentation today. 
single cell data science is a very fascinating area of research. The data analysis tasks are becoming more and more complex and more and more challenging, but it is a very great testing ground for developing and applying AI and machine learning methods. And lastly, I would like to thank my collaborators and my team members and NIH funding to allow me to do this kind of research, which is really cool. Uh, it evolves every single day. Thank you so much. Glenn, thank you so much for that. That was really a, a fantastic tour to learn about uh, single cell analytics and the, the various methods um, like RNA-seq that are being applied. Um, one of the things that we, in our sequence of, of talks, have talked a lot about um, places where various biases or various distortions of data may occur that may affect one's ability to properly interpret and apply it. And I'm kind of curious in your experience um, where potential, I mean, given that there's so many different processing steps with each one being a potential to introduce some degree of bias, I'm curious about your perception of where those might be and what can be done about it. That's a really wonderful question, great question. So, you know, right now, most of the benchmark studies, they're evaluating one function at a one time. So they really don't, they take it like a in silo approach to evaluate, okay, for example, if I wanted to evaluate clustering, I care about that. But the, pro, the steps before clustering may not be the variations, the bias come out from the pre-processing steps are not really uh, being, uh, recapitulated in that way. So I think, uh, you know, every, you're right, you're absolutely right. Every single process step could very well introduce bias, right? Every time we do some dimension reduction, you're actually reducing the data complexity. Uh, so there is definitely some sort of uh, interactions go consequences or impact among different steps, data processing steps. And currently this is a really rare, you know, people don't really pay too much attention about it. But it, the, the fact that that's so important, we really need to step back and look at it heuristically. You know, rather than benchmarking individual steps or modules, should we benchmark all the pipelines? Within the pipelines, there has been many different ways of doing things, so the, the, do the flows. So I think more holistic approach would be very important to really evaluate where the interactions happens, where the bias you know, come out from which step is most dominant and how we can avoid them. Yeah, I think you know the longer your processing workflow becomes, the, the more, the greater, distance, if you will, there is between your result and the original data, if you will. And as that distance is kind of, you know, pushed further and further with all the different methodologies, you know, you mentioned about all the different data reduction techniques that people have attempted to apply. And every one of those that one applies, you know, moves the data a little bit further from what was actually collected. And it's all very exciting because as you point out so rightly so, there, there's just a rich area of opportunity to develop methods and to process the data in clever ways. But some of those may be, you know, maybe the result of some bias that happened in an earlier step, or they're introducing a bias, which some other subsequent step picks up and runs with. And so these are just things that uh, I'm just kind of curious about. Yes, I, I see your point. You know, you, we, what people mostly are doing, what well, an analogy is you're looking at a local maximum, local optimum, but you're not looking at a global optimum. So that's what I see the problem right now with all those different evaluation tools. Yeah. Um, are there any groups who are attempting to develop um, standards or sets of best practice for how people report studies in single cell um, data analytics that might help to provide at least some guardrails to keep people from straying too far off into the margins and presenting stuff that's not reproducible or may have biases in them or anything like that? Uh, I think that there is general sense, the, you know, uh, in terms of, for example, benchmarking, there has been publications, a group of people um, 
where they laid out uh, like a 10 different rules that you need to consider in terms of collecting the data, what kind of data, what kind of data sets to include in the benchmarking, uh, what kind of metrics you can use, how do you evaluate the, you know, rank those methods, et cetera. Uh, so there are some, you know, concepts there, recommendations, so to speak, a guideline recommendation. But I think in terms of standardization, particularly in single cell field, right now it's still kind of wild west. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think the the, the 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 issue there is that you know the technology has been going so fast, right? If it's not a speed of light, but it, uh, it's definitely changing every single day. And because the technology is changing every single day, so the the that data analytical folks, uh, most majority of them, are running after those technologies and figure out how to analyze it. You know how to develop a new method, novel method, so to speak, that performs best on the user's data. So that's where most effort is. And then over time, what people start to realize: wait a minute. There are so many methods being developed. We need to have some way to evaluate them because we ourselves, we don't know which ones to use. So they yeah. have a benchmark effort. However, even in the benchmark studies, there are shortcomings, there, there's problems, weakness, issues as well. So I, I feel like now needs to have some sort of meta form of a benchmark, have some sort of standardization. Um, you know, one of the things I, I I'm thinking is back then in the micro race space, there is this kind of QC community, right? Yeah. That was set up to evaluate the systematically um, different platforms. And, you know, take a, take a genomic, genomic scientists have been doing that systematic uh, uh, comparison of the different uh, uh, methods, uh, experimental methods. So there has been effort to do that. And I think there are some really good uh, uh, standards there. But in terms of the computational aspect, I still think we have a long way to go. You know, even for benchmark studies themselves, they're not really easy to be adapted for the future use. So that's mm -hmm. one big problem, right? I'm also curious about um, the role of reference data sets. Um, you know, we're often doing things where we take a sample uh, of you know some someone's DNA and we're comparing it against a reference uh, DNA data set to look for insertions or deletions or single nucleotide polymorphisms and et cetera et cetera. Um, mm. But if there's any you know th those you know, very often those reference data sets are from a single individual who happens to be rich and famous. <laughs> um, and so there may be a little bias in there, right? Um, or yes. they're not necessarily population-based or, or sometimes they are, but not, not always representative of uh, uh, the broader uh, uh, world population. They may be, you know, there's a, some uh, kind of um, uh, acquisition bias or various other things which creep in. I'm curious about the role of those reference databases as a, as a source of potential conflict there. That is also a source of an issue because, you know, um, I mean, you know, for, 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 for the SNPs, the GWAS community, gen genetics community, recently there has been one paper coming out, I think they were using your population-based reference panel now rather than one reference, right? right. Um, but in the single cell field, you know, they're still just trying to get the atlas going um, there is this community, human cell atlas, if you are studying human tissues, so, so there, there is a community that collects, if you are part of the community, then you contribute your data as part of the atlas uh, consortium. Um, in human cell atlas, it focuses on the normal, normal, normal tissues, not diseased tissues. So potentially that's a good place to, 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 to start with a reference. But again, you know, right now, I think because, because it's a, a community, voluntary community, how many, how many people you need to collect as samples for reference? How do you control the other uh, confounders in the population heterogeneous, you know, for the epidemiologists, yeah. they know very well, the human populations are very different. Uh, so how do you control the population level heterogeneity? I think probably it's starting to think, you know, like people like me were thinking about it, but obviously I'm not the one who's designing the experiment yet. But I think the two communities need to somehow start to talk to each other 
and and I, and I definitely I think folks are interested to know you know what would be a good reference um you know right now I think one the best reference that have been generated in the in the in the human tissues is probably in the blood that one has a lot of samples mm. it's more or less similar if you look at them but of course, when you compare different uh, different uh, people's uh, data, you need to do some alignment. But more or less, PBMC cells, they are they are more or less similar. But if you look at some other tissues, there are definitely individual level difference. So, how do you control those kind of individual level difference? How do you have uh, enough representation for the so-called norm? I think that's an open question. You know, the whole community need to come in, and especially. Uh, human cell analysis the folks needed to perhaps think about uh, where is their next roadmap. Now we started, uh, you know, this big project on uh, collecting all the human tissues and then how many would be enough? Uh, some sort of experimentation, maybe around simulation. I, 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 this is just my wild guess. You have collected some pilot samples and you could run simulation to see, based on those pilot samples, to see at what point you reach a situation. At what point the variation is not going to be much different anymore. It's not going to cause big, big change in terms of downstream analysis. Well, it sounds like there is still a lot of work to do, but it's very exciting. And like I just as you kind of point out in your talk, there's just a lot of room for methods development. However, there's a lot of things to be kind of wary of and uh, make sure to, to uh, as bioinformaticians and people developing AI solutions and machine learning, different sources of, uh, of variance, of bias, of other things to be kind of accounted for. So Lana Garmeyer from University of Michigan, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your work and sharing this uh, uh, summary of uh, single cell uh, uh, data processing and bioinformatics has been wonderful having a chat with you today thank you so much my great pleasure thank you so much thank, thank you, you Jack. thank you and uh, everyone remember that uh, monday afternoon is the last time when you can uh, apply for our biomedical data science innovation lab and i hope you do everyone have a great weekend well i'll see you next week bye now bye, -bye.